Well, good morning, Calvary, and thanks to all of the mothers in the room who made it possible for us guys to be able to celebrate a holiday. <laughs> Happy Father's Day, guys. <laughs> Woo! If you're one of our men that are here, or if your father's not here, if you have someone that you want to connect with, when you leave, we're going to invite you to stop by the Connection Centers on both sides and pick up a, uh, it's a Spiritual Fathers, a six-week devotional guide in honors of Father's Day. Great read, great challenge for us to, to look through and read, and it's our gift to you to say thanks for being part of the Calvary family. Uh, we're continuing our study in the book of Romans, um, so for some reason, if you happen to miss church and you, you've not caught up with the entire series, you can go to calvarylhc.com and you can connect with us. There's a little block that'll drop down to say sermons. Just click on that and you can go and you can catch up with the series. Uh, or if you're traveling, it's a great way to stay in touch with your home church from there. Also, uh, in the in the in the Seats that are in front of you are Bibles, and if you need a Bible, desire a Bible, or know someone that you would like to put a Bible in their hand, I'm just going to encourage you to take one of those that are under the seats that are there um, and carry it with you. Right now, if you don't have one, turn to page 1199, while the rest of you turn to Romans chapter 6, and we're going to read God's Word together and begin uh, studying and hopefully hearing what God's message is for us today. Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey of sin, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were commanded. And having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. Now I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard of righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at the time from the things of which you were now ashamed? For the end of these things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit that you get leads to sanctification and it ends eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, <clears throat> this is a concept that Paul is sharing with us. And most of the time when we hear the word slave, it has a real negative connotation. It has a connotation of what I grew up with in the South as uh, someone owning another person against their will. The, the common culture at this time was folks willingly giving themselves into slavery, and this is what Paul is talking about here, and saying, hey, for a period of time, I'll work for you for this amount. We know that as bond sermon, the bond slaves today in our culture today, but that was a very common practice. It was also a real common practice when nations overtook other nations, they took um, the captives and made them slaves, and they had to serve uh, in, the, in the areas uh, that they were designated to. They didn't have a choice, but can I just tell you, every one of you in this room has a choice. You chose this morning of where you were going to come and worship. Some of you actually chose the seat that you were going to sit in this morning, and you came in. Some of you came in and you looked, and someone else was in your seat. And you're sitting behind them right now, you're looking at the back of their head, and you're thinking all sorts of evil thoughts about them. <laughs> so can I just tell you to go ahead and repent, apologize to that person that's sitting in front of you that took your seat, and promise them that you're going to buy them lunch as soon as this service is over. And that'll be a good thing. You also have an opportunity to, to choose or a choice for your attitude. And can I just encourage you, do not ever give anyone else the right to choose the attitude that you're going to have. That's your choice. 
That's your choice. You choose what to wear, you choose what to eat, and you choose your attitude. In this scripture, for the sake of conversation today, instead of using the term slave, which may have a negative context or connotation to some of us, I want to incorporate to us and with us a different term, and it kind of interchanges, and it's going to lead to the last verse that we're going to talk about in this morning's message, and that's boss, B-O-S-S, having a boss. Well, there's two bosses that Paul talks about here. The first boss is if you choose to serve sin, it'll lead you to death. Serving sin leads to death. Now, before we go any further, let's define biblically what the term sin actually means. James 4, 17 says, sin is this. To him that knoweth to do right and chooses not to do it, to him it's sin. Did you notice what it said? You know the right thing to do. You choose not to do it. It's sin to you. Now, if you choose sin, can I just let you know right up front, your life is on a path of destruction and eternal death. It will separate you from God's presence for all of eternity. However, there is hope. Remember, I said that you have a choice. You can choose to serve boss sin, or you can choose to serve God. And if you choose to serve God, that'll lead you to righteousness or rightness. You see, choosing to be obedient to God was his design for all of humanity. God gave us how many rules to start off with? One. And guys, I just got to tell you, it's Father's Day, and that rule involved eating. How many men in here are excited about lunch that you're going to get to share in just a little bit? Mass quantities of protein, I'm praying, right? And all of the men said, y'all are not real hungry. Y'all have had breakfast before you came in here. All right, but here's what it is. God gave us one rule. We blew it. So I hope you've come to realize, however, that even though we blew the one rule, God loves you. God is for you. Genesis 127 says you were created in the image of a holy God. Now I want you to imagine just for a moment you're looking at a big mirror of yourself. And I know that's difficult for some of you. You don't like looking in the mirror. But just indulge. Just imagine just for a moment you're looking in the mirror. And as you're looking at that image, looking back at you, here's what I want you to say to yourself. Man, God has a sense of humor. (laughs) I say that quite often in the morning time when I look at that. Sometimes I actually call the mirror a liar because I don't believe what I'm seeing. But that's not what this passage is about. This passage is not about a physical being. It's about the image of righteousness or right relationship with God. Not just that physical appearance, but an image of righteousness within ourselves. Because if you allow God to be the boss, he's pouring his Holy Spirit into you so that you'll be able to progress in the process of a word called sanctification. Now, to get to that process, there's a beginning part, and it involves a choice. That choice involved you accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior, or becoming what we commonly refer in the church lingo as being saved. If you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ as Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. You see, God sought, fought his way to us in that while we were yet sinners, God allowed Christ to die for the forgiveness of our sins. Now, that starts the journey. And because while we were in that sinful state, God sent Jesus to die for us, we are given and brought into this world of reconciliation or we are justified to himself. Several weeks ago, you heard Chad talk about justification, just as if you had not sinned. And so that sanctification process began when you were justified by surrendering your life to Christ, if you allow God to be your Savior. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I love old Westerns. Anybody here love Westerns? So y'all like the gray movies too, huh? 
Right. My kids used to tell me, Dad, why are you watching gray movies? And I'm like, gray movies? What is a gray movie? And I'm looking at it. I thought there was some, you know, young teenage lingo to that. But I found out that it was actually black and white and they just called it gray, which actually it is gray. I still call it black and white, but they call it gray. And what would happen when the good guys would surround the bad guys and they had their six shooters out or their guns out and they would say, stick them up, right? They'd say, surrender. So what did the bad guys do? If they were smart, what did they do? They dropped their weapons and they raised their hands, right? Are y'all with me? Yeah. So let's find out how many of you are with me. Here's what I want you to do. I want you just to raise your hands here in an image of, of surrender now I know that that rocks some of your world I know that some of you have never raised your hand in a Southern Baptist Church before and I actually had some of my Pentecostal friends come up to me and said Chet when you ask us to raise our hands I started to stand up and start shouting <laughs> surrender right now if God leads you to stand up and start shouting and you're bringing glory to him that's okay but if you're bringing glory to yourself, that's not okay. I surrender. Here's a beautiful image, isn't it? Yeah, you can put your hands down because some of us are getting tired of holding them up. It's a beautiful image of what God requires of us. Not that physical, I surrender. That's not what God's asking for. Remember that image of righteousness that he talked about? It's our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength to give everything under God's control no longer our control and we have that choice we have a choice to serve boss sin or we have a, a choice to serve boss God in our life whichever one we choose to serve we are going to earn a wage what wages are you earning what pay are you receiving will depend on which boss you serve, how he's going to pay you. Now, if you choose boss sin, according to verse 19, it will lead to impurity and lawlessness. So let's talk briefly about impurity. Impurity begins with the thought process of leading to lawlessness, which is evil deeds in our lives. Now, I don't know how women think because I've never been a woman. I've been married to a beautiful one for 27 years, but I still don't know how she thinks, all right? But I know how us as guys think. And I gave you a pre-warning a while ago. Pretty much now that I planted that seed and most of the guys I did in here, they're thinking about that steak that they're going to eat for lunch. And they want it nice and thick and medium rare with lots of sauce and baked potato, right? Ladies, just throwing you a bone there, just saying. <laughs> now, that's an impure thought. Why? Because that probably is going to lead to gluttony, which is then going to lead to a nap, which will lead to laziness <laughs> or sluggardness. You see how the thought process just kind of just eases right in there and it takes over our thought process. And if my boss is sin, I am earning pain and misery. I am earning separation from God. That's going to be exactly what I get paid. Misery and pain and separation from God. But can I tell you there's hope? Because you don't have to choose boss sin. You can choose boss God. If my boss is God, it's going to lead us to righteousness and we will receive eternity. You see, followers of Christ are on a journey to all of eternity, but not just the end of life, not just our fire insurance paid up, not just making sure that at the end we see God face to face and we spend all of eternity with him, but that we have life here on this earth and have it more abundantly. And it's in a process called sanctification. We are justified because Christ died for our sins, and we're on this journey, this process of becoming more Christ-like. Now, the meaning of sanctification is this, being made or becoming holy or set apart for use in a special purpose. Becoming holy or set apart for use in a special purpose. Wow, think about this. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
Now, if we step through that gate of justification and we're on that process of sanctification, those are big words, but it's actually a process to becoming set apart and holy for a special purpose. Can I just remind every single one of you in this room who has professed Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have a special purpose in this life to accomplish, and God has equipped and given you great opportunities to serve. Now, here's something else that I want to remind us of. We are created God's handiwork. Every single one of you is uniquely made, individual, God-crafted, God-handcrafted, one of a kind. No one else is exactly like you are. Now, we may have children or grandchildren that favor us, but they are handcrafted by God as well, and he has given each of us a purpose to serve him. Now, here's what we get to do. We get to figure out all of the wonderful things that God has created for us to serve him. And can I just tell you, some of you were created to be phenomenal dads in this world. Some of you were created to be exemplary moms in this world. Some of you were created to be educators, some doctors, some lawyers. Some of you were created to be, have the ability to make mass quantities of dollars and fund ministry. But a lot of you are sitting here going, Chet, that doesn't qualify me for any of this. Can I just tell you, in a room this size, I know without a shadow of a doubt, there's a tremendous need that Calvary has. And I'm just going to challenge you to think and pray about it. We have a small group culture called Life Groups. We have over 1,000 folks that attend and classify themselves as part of Calvary and are part of our life group culture. We have over 80 groups, which means we have close to about 160 life group leaders. And we could use about 100 more life group leaders, just so you know. Because our average attendance is right at 2,000, and we're halfway there. We want more life group leaders. We're asking that you look God in the face and say, Chet, I am not qualified. I am not equipped. And if you only knew how imperfect I was, there's no way you'd be talking to me. Well, I've got great news for you. I'm going to keep talking to you and I'm going to keep challenging you. But it's not so much what Chet does. is 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 what God does for you. My prayer is that God, as Chad put it two weeks ago, haunts you until you call Pastor Mike and say, sign me up. I've got a place to meet and I want to lead a life group. Because God has equipped me for that great work in advance. And I am ready to join him. And see, you're on that sanctification process, becoming more Christ-like. However, here's the number one excuse that I get. I'm not qualified, Chet. God does not expect perfection. So what most of you are saying is not that I'm not qualified. It's, Chet, I'm not perfect, and I can't do this. Nowhere in God's word does it say you have to be perfect. Do you realize how many imperfect men and women God used throughout his word to further the kingdom? He took a man who slaughtered Christians and created him to be one of the most dynamic missionaries of all time, Paul. And we're studying what he wrote today. We somehow, unfortunately, the have conveyed to the church to be a good Christian, to be a good follower of Jesus Christ, you must be perfect. God asked for improvement, not perfection. He desires improvement. We are perfect only through Christ. And how do we start that process? By surrendering our life to God and saying, God, I want to be on that journey to perfection with you, I'll only arrive at that perfection when I achieve heaven. And that's at the end of our lives. You see, God only created one perfect being. His name was Jesus Christ. We murdered him as a heretic. We hung him on a cross and we crucified him. And then we buried him in a tomb. But praise God, he didn't stay in that tomb. On the third day he arose, he appeared to Mary and Martha, and he appeared to over 500 at one time, and he ascended into heaven, and he gave us encouragement that he's coming back to judge the living and the dead. So what did you hear me say? 
I hope you heard me say God does not require perfection. He desires improvement. Now, some of you are going to say, Chet, you just don't know me. You're right. But let me ask you a question. Think with me just for a minute. Imagine again with me. Look at your life. Look in that mirror and think. Twelve months ago, where was your life with Christ? What did it look like? Did you grow closer to Christ and more Christ-like six months ago or six weeks ago? Or maybe some of you, it is as early as six hours ago. Some of you, it may have been six minutes ago when you realized, hey, there's some things in your life that you wanted to confess and you wanted to be closer to God. You wanted to surrender your life to following Christ. It's an improvement. It's on a journey. It's where we're headed to. And so because it's Father's Day, I want to share a couple of things. You see, personally, I grew up in a household with a father who demanded perfection. And I literally mean demanded perfection and beat the punk out of you if you didn't give him that. He demanded it. He was an abusive father who beat my mother and I bloody on a regular basis. And by all statistics, I should be an alcoholic who beats my kids and beats my wife. My kids are all here this weekend. And they will tell you. Now, they may tell you as kids that they got beat. And I remind them, iniquity is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline shall drive it far, far away. Even though you shall beat the child with the rod, they shall surely not die. There's a difference in discipline and beating them with anger, right? And I, I, I reminded them of that. But here's the deal. Statistics say that I ought to be an alcoholic and I ought to be an abuser. I'm neither. But my father taught me three wonderful things. And this is how he taught me. One, he taught me how to love God. Because that abusive person is the one that introduced me to Jesus Christ. Secondly, my dad taught me how to love and to respect women. Not by the way he treated them, but what he did that I did not want to do. I learned what not to do, to love my wife and to be respectful of my wife. And praise God, she's been married to this old country boy for 27 years. And about six months ago, she renewed that commitment for another 27 years. So I'm counting on every minute of it. <laughs> Amen. And the third thing that I learned out of this abusive relationship with my father was how to work hard. He gave me a career-mindedness. And as a result of that, I could have chosen to be just exactly like my earthly father, who I loved and respected. But I chose a different path. I chose to allow God to be my boss. I chose to allow him to turn my life in a different direction. I stepped on that treadmill of life called sanctification. And for the last 40 years, 42 years, I have been on a journey to become more and more Christ-like on a daily basis. And it's an uphill journey, by the way. It's not one of those flat treadmills. It's like one of those that you get on to check your heart rate. It's an incline, and we're growing. But here's the other thing. I can't tell you it was always easy. I can't tell you what all I did right and what you should do that's right, but I can tell you what I didn't do right. And hopefully you won't make the same mistakes. Because I had this father as a model, I chose to go down the path that he went down. I pursued the corporate career and what all of that meant and making the big bucks. I also choose to abuse alcohol three different times in my life to cover the pain. And as a result of overworking in these areas and the pursuit of those in alcohol, I chose to become a workaholic. I knew I was in trouble when I didn't know what grade my kids were in, nor did I know their teacher's name. But yet I was trusting these educators to be the ones that taught my kids that God was going to hold me accountable for. That's when I knew I had made a terrible, terrible mistake and God got my attention. So can I tell you, if you are choosing that same path, and some of you in this same room chose that path in the past, and unfortunately, some of you right now, out of love, I'm going to tell you the truth, are on that path that I was on. 
Can I just encourage you to stop wanting to please boss sin? Because that's what it is. Can I tell you that peace and joy will not be found in a pill or an alcohol bottle? Can I just encourage you in the fact that it won't be found in overworking and trying to make additional dollars and growing a fat bank account? It will not be found in extramarital involvement or relationship. It will only be found in a personal relationship with our Heavenly Father. It will be found in you choosing life, not death, salvation, not damnation. It will set you free if you choose boss God. And I have a really, really, really deep theological question for you right now. What's the best coffee in the world? Starbucks, okay. Sorry. (laughs) I was informed that the best coffee in the world is free coffee. (laughs) Right? Whether it's Starbucks, human being, whichever one. And and I don't know about you guys, it, it, there was a fundraiser uh, this week for the Lydic family who lost his life. Brad lost his life, and he left a widow and two kids that are part of Calvary Christian Academy. And as a result, I said, you know, this would be a pretty good idea to get something from them. So I, I, I went and I, and I got gift cards, $20 gift cards. That means that there's $20 on this card, and someone can get free coffee for this. And it's, it's free. It's free to you. It's a free gift to you. Oh, okay. So here, here's the challenge. Come on, come on. Here we go. We're going to have a race here. I love this. Um, what, what's the deal here? The Free coffee is here, right? Yep. And where are you two? Right here. Okay, where do you need to be? You need to be up there. Okay. Okay. Here's the free coffee. <laughs> I forgot how tall I forgot how tall Jim was. Isn't that, however, a beautiful picture? Here's something I want you to think about. When did that turn into free coffee for him? When he took possession. When he said, I want it. I accept it. I take it. God is standing here talking to every person's heart in this room right now saying, it's a free gift. Because you see, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And it's a free gift to you if you choose to accept it. My prayer is that every single one of you in this room do not leave without it. Choosing boss God in your life. That you'll choose life, eternal life today, and not death today. Will you join me in prayer?